next at Grace Gathering. Let's lift our hands to the Lord. Father God, I thank you for the church of God this morning. I thank you for each and every soul that's here today, Lord. Father, open your word to our minds and to our hearts that we may understand the deep things of God. Lord, my lips are sanctified to teach the word of God today by your grace and your endowments upon my life, Lord. Let my flesh not get in the way of the spirit this morning. And Father, we are sanctified by your truth and we receive your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to continue on our journey through eschatology, or the doctrine of last things and what the Bible has to say. We're in part six, and last week we, we, uh, we were in Paul. We're going to continue in Paul because Paul has a lot to say on this subject. And so, uh, last week, look at that. Somehow, sometimes you got to give the extra oomph right there, and it makes it, I don't know why, it's like sometimes I just go boom, boom, boom a couple times, and it just, you just, you know, persevere through it, and it moves. Don't know how that happens. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> So Paul basically, uh, we categorized three main areas of Paul's teaching. He teaches on foundational doctrine, and that consists of hope. And he talks about our future resurrection and glorification, which we, we learned uh, way back in week two when we did Romans 8 and last week in 1 Corinthians 15. Then he has warnings about deception, the Antichrist, and apostasy. We're going to go there today. And he also <clears throat> talks about a prophetic timeline, and he gives us a a, a sequence of last day's events. He answers the question, what happens to the church? And that we talked about that last week. But there's going to be a second part of it that he talks about to the Thessalonians. Now, just a background on the Thessalonians. They were a church that was under some stress. There obviously and evidently was some great persecution there. And there was also, uh, they were in the middle of the hub of the spread of Gnosticism. So there was a lot of false doctrine uh, that was challenging the church. It actually came into most of the churches in the Asia Minor area and in Greece and was pulling people away from sound doctrine. You see, back then, they didn't have someone like Sal to help them out, so they had to just rely on the Apostle Paul's letters. So I want to just really quickly, we're just going to digest some things to, set the, 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 uh, set the stage for the big, uh, famous Thessalonian, Thess 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So let's just look a snapshot at verse 1 to give you a feel of what Paul was saying here and to build his uh, teaching here. All this is clear evidence of God's righteous judgment, and so you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. See, they were under great persecution. After all, it is only right for God to, listen to this, repay with affliction those who afflict you. Everyone see that? Put that in the back of your mind. Repay with affliction those who afflict you you. Remember, they're under persecution right now. <clears throat> There's multiple forces that is trying to stamp out this young church, and Paul is encouraging here. He says, listen, God's got your back, and in his time, he's going to deal with these people. And sometimes I, I take that into my own life. You ever have people that oppress you? Right? Sometimes you got to keep it out of your spirit and just turn it over to God. He's going to deal with that person and he eventually makes everything right. And to grant you, verse 7, relief to you who were oppressed and to us as well. When the Lord Jesus is revealed, say is revealed, from heaven with his mighty angels in a blazing fire. Blazing fire is an indication of great judgment. <clears throat> and so all of our relief is eventually going to come when? When Jesus returns. So there's some things you're going to suffer through a long time. And he goes on to say, he will inflict vengeance on those who do not know God. This is hard to take right here. People do not like this type of passage. It's not popular to preach on this anymore. But I have to open up the word because the word is the word. Amen? He will inflict vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
they will suffer the penalty of separated from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in I like how he says this in his saints and regarded with wonder by all who have believed including you who have believed our testimony so look Paul is set in the backdrop here and he's going to go on to some deep teaching in a, in a second here but there's some heavy duty scriptures right there I mean, we're not singing it's a holly jolly Christmas today when we open up this kind of stuff. I mean, he's talking about last day's things. He's talking about what's eventually going to happen. It, this is irrevocable. It is plain as day, and I don't argue. People, people especially do not like this part. There is a very popular uh, movement in the church that is very progressive that speaks against all of this stuff and tries to explain it away. Now, I, we have to be very, very careful because, you know, how we handle this because we don't want to walk around with fire and brimstone all the time amen but at the same time we have to treat it with reverence because these are the events that are going to happen amen so let's move forward this is the big famous chapter people have in Christianity people have bloodbaths over this chapter because there are specific events in here and some people who get totally pulled into non-stop eschatology uh, really salivate over this chapter because of the descriptive things and there's all different camps that believe different things that try to say this is what it says this is what it says and they have very different views I'm gonna lay it out straight I'm gonna lay out what it says in the conclusions and you can decide for yourself amen you got to be like the Bereans you have to judge the word for yourself right so I'm gonna make what I consider as fair presentation I can of the scriptures here and let God speak to you amen so how and when so now Paul's going to answer because he's answering a question here. So he described to you what's going to happen. Now he's going to get descriptive about it. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being, say it with me, gathered together to him. Gathered together to him. Very important uh, uh, doctrine that comes out of this statement right here. Uh, we ask you, brothers, not to be easily disconcerted or alarmed by any spirit or message or letter presuming to be from us, alleging that the day of the Lord is already come. Okay, so this is where we kind of have to connect the dots from the full counsel of Scripture. If you move over to 2 Timothy and 1 Timothy, he's talking about some things that were going on in the church. There was a teaching that said Jesus has already returned. It was, gained, it was quite popular. And it was based out of Gnosticism, where they believed in a spiritual return of Christ. And there's not going to be a literal return. Uh, these days, this is, this is rapidly gaining, uh, gaining a lot of traction in the church shockingly maybe a lot of you might not have been exposed to it but out in the general church they actually have bible schools dedicated to what's called the doctrine of preterism preterism states that most of the end time eschatology or all of it has already been completed and all of this is allegorical and it's quite popular. I mean, it is very, very popular. There are speakers out there. There are campuses teaching these stuff where thousands of people are going to learn this stuff, and they believe this. So they would say, well, this, is, this already happened. So we don't have to worry about this. But you know what's awesome about the scriptures? I like when, when in the scriptures there's preventative teachings in there. And they're all over scripture. And for those of you, many of you know, I've, I've said this before, but there are preventative, the Holy, see the Holy Spirit anticipated every false teaching that would ever come. And he already targeted, and there's, always, there's already scripture for it. You know, when he said, uh, Virgin Mary is your mediatrix. Well, we know that the, that the book of Hebrews says there was only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. See, so the Holy Spirit anticipated that that would be a worldwide teaching at some point. And he, he, he already laid out the truth, right? There, there's, a doc, there's a doctrine around called uh, reincarnation. Very popular. Well, there's a scripture that says man is destined to die once 
and then faces judgment. See, so the Holy Spirit already anticipated all these teachings, these false teachings that would come, and it's already in the Word of God. There's hundreds of these. It's fascinating. And this is another one right here, because if you connect the dots now to 2 Timothy, there was these guys called Hymenius and Philetus, who were, I, I believe, I'm pretty sure, it, it, kind of speculative, but my best guess is they were Gnostic teachers, and Gnosticism was quite famous for preaching that Jesus, there was not going to be a literal return. And Paul says they overthrew the faith of some people by teaching this in the church, and he called it gangrene. He, interestingly, he called it gangrene. It rots out the foundation of faith when you accept this teaching. And so he turned these guys over to Satan. It's right in the, you read First and Second Timothy, it's fascinating. He turned them over to Satan because it was blasphemy. Now this was serious business. There was something about believing at the incarnate return, physical return of Christ that is very important to your salvation. Evidently so much so that Paul turned people over to Satan because it was blasphemy. So uh, to me, this is a very serious thing. Amen? So we all know who's behind all of it. The devil is behind all. We war not against flesh and blood, right? So Hymenius and Philetus were flesh and blood. That's not what we're warring against. We're warning against the spirit that's behind him. Because you'll notice it says, don't be alarmed by any spirit, message, or letter presuming to be from us. So these guys were masking as false apostles. Now, if the early church came under this type of attack, where do you think we're at right now in the year 2019? I can tell you, you know, uh, I've talked to a, a lot of veteran ministers I know, and they said over the past 10 years, there's been such an uptick in these false teachings that we can't even keep up. I mean, the stuff you had back in the 70s and 80s, I mean, this stuff is multiplying so fast. I had a guy arguing with Brother Guy the other day, and he said, the only reason Stephen got stoned because he didn't know how to claim his authority. And the only reason Peter got crucified because he didn't know how to claim his authority. I mean, I th every week I think I've heard it all, and then it gets wackier. <laughs> Just the ridiculous stuff. So this is why I teach sound doctrine. This is why I'm a word-centered minister. You've got to get to the Word of God in all of these things. And it's, to me, it's clear as day. Why, why do we have to do jumping jacks to get around this stuff? Just accept it and adjust accordingly. Amen? So Paul, under the unction of the Spirit, lays out the prophetic sequence of exact events of what's going to happen around Christ's return. Now he gets, he gets a little descriptive here. All right? So now he's going to talk about this man of lawlessness. This man of lawlessness that's going to be revealed. And we know, you remember back four weeks ago when we talked about what John had to say. And it's frightening how what John said and what Paul said and what Jesus said exactly mirror one another to the T. So there's going to be some sort of apostasy. There's going to be some sort of spiritual force that is going to deceive even the elect if possible. I'm watching more deception go on in, in the church than in the world right now. We expect it out of the world, but the church is falling away. It's unmooring itself from the scriptures. It's, in other words, you know, when a ship is moored in a, in a safe harbor, it can survive the storms and the winds and the waves. It's safe. It's moored. When you unmoor yourself from the scripture, you float away into danger. And you're rudderless and just floating wherever the waves and the winds take you. Very much how Paul described it in Ephesians chapter 4. This is very chilling stuff here. Listen to what he says in verse 3. And I made this nice and big so you get a big, happy helping of it. Let no one deceive you in any way. You could stop right there and that's a message entirely of itself. Who's responsible for getting deceived? When you get to heaven, you're not going to be able to say, well, pastor so-and-so had a really convincing teaching on it. <clears throat> you know where the most dangerous place in the church is? The pulpit. 
the pulpit. The pulpit is a sacred place. And I don't just mean this literal pulpit. It means any platform where you teach from. It could be a book. It could be a, a video. It could be a, a CD or a live person like myself in the pulpit of God, in the teaching platform, teaching the flock of God. It is the most dangerous place in the world. You have to be very careful what comes out of a pulpit. You have to be very careful to judge everything that minister says and hold them accountable to the Word of God. You cannot just accept anything that is said without checking it with the Spirit of God and with the Word of God. Amen? I could be wrong sometimes. Now, hopefully I've earned your trust over the years that I'm a competent uh, and effectual minister of the Word of God. And so, we go back to this, let no one deceive you. For it will not come. The coming of the lawless man will not come until the apostasy occurs. Munch on that for a second. The Antichrist is not going to make his full appearance until the church first apostatizes on a mass scale. To me, that's what the scripture says. I think it's pretty crystal clear. Okay, the man of lawlessness will not come until the apostasy. And he's not talking about the world. The world can't apostatize. They were never in to begin with. We're going to look at that deeper in a second. The, and the apostasy occurs, and the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, is revealed in the midst of the great apostasy of the church. Now, this is both progressive and it's going to be an event. We know that the, that the Antichrist spirit is at work. Remember John? He already is at work. The Antichrist was at work when Paul wrote this. The Antichrist is progressively going to get stronger and stronger over time. Do you think that this letter was written almost 2,000 years ago now, that maybe he's at a, the Antichrist is more powerful and influential than he was back then? I would take it to mean that. I would take it to mean that the last day believers, as you go forward in time, and, and look, I don't know when the Lord's coming. It could be a thousand years yet. But we have to live ready. Amen? So let's take a look at this word apostasy or the rebellion, right? In the dictionary, it means a falling away or a defection, an abandoning of one has, what one has believed as in faith, cause, or principles. That's from the Webster's Dictionary. Used to describe a falling away from the faith and a session from the church, a disowning of the name of Christ. From the Greek, apostasa, it means from two words, to leave or depart, and from apo, away from, actually three, and histomai, to stand. So that means a departure or a desertion, or literally a leaving from, from a previous standing. You cannot apostatize from your faith if you were not in it. So this cannot be talking about non-believers. I have witnessed in my personal life Friends who have apostatized. People who I used to be in Bible studies with. People who I used to be Christian brothers and sisters and we worship or, or share the word together and fellowship. And I've watched people literally denounce Christ and walk away. Now, if I've just seen it in my little life and I'm not Joe Popular, I can only imagine what's going out there, the stories I hear. We know this won't happen in the Kirkland house, though. <clears throat> so here's the description of what he's going to do when he gets here and what that spirit is already actively at work for. Verse 4, he will oppose, one, and he will exalt himself, number two. Two things. He's going to oppose the church of God. He's going to oppose God's kingdom, and he wants to exalt himself over the kingdom of God. Very simple. That is the psychological profile of Satan. Plain and simple, broken down in its simplest form. He will oppose. Do you think he's, he wants to oppose this church? Do you think he wants to exalt himself? He wants to exalt himself above every so-called God or object of worship. This is, this is even talking about religions. He wants to elevate himself even above the man-made religions. 
So he will seat himself in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. This is the deepest form of blasphemy you can get. Mm-hmm. Now this term, the temple of God, is quite interesting. Let's take a look at that real quick. The temple of God. There are three possible meanings to this based on its scripture usage. Number one, it literally meant a house of worship. The Old Testament temple was a physical house of worship. And this is often interpreted by many to say that there's going to be a third Jewish temple that will be built and the Antichrist will rule from it. That's, there's other scriptures that kind of support this. So there's a literal, a literal house of worship. Jesus is going to sit in a literal seat when he returns and rule from some place in Jerusalem. Number two. The believer is known as the temple of God. Each believer is considered that. 1 Corinthians 6.19, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Number three, the church. The church houses God's presence on earth, Ephesians 2, 20 and 22. So there's three possible meanings to this. So could the mystery of this interpretation be of the three, one of the three or all of them? I believe literally there could be a possibility it's all of them. I believe that there's going to be eventually a literal Jewish third temple. I believe the apostasy is when the believers start denouncing Christ and Christian sound doctrine and Satan takes up residence in the believer. And I believe also Satan is going to take up residence in segments of the church. I believe that Satan already has taken up segments of the church right now. I would say to you, there is a possibility, and I could be wrong here, I would say conservatively, 70 to 80% of the church has been compromised worldwide. And you know how I can tell, how I can judge that or come to that conclusion logically? Because their doctrine is in shambles and does not align up with the Word of God or their practices. And I'm not going to name names right now, getting all into that. But don't think because you're evangelical you're safe. Don't believe because you're Catholic you know what you're talking about. Or, 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 or charismatic or Pentecostal, all of them have antichrist doctrines in many places. Doesn't matter what denomination. In fact, I could say that the, the sign that there's denominations itself means that we're already divided and under its influence. Because there should be no divisions in the church, Paul said. We should all agree on the Word of God. We may have different cultures. We may have a little bit different flavor of our practices or the way we do church. But we should all agree on the core principles of the Word of God. We should all agree on the foundations of faith. But yet there's very little agreement. If I brought in three or four different denominations and sent them in, in segments around this room, I'll bet you I would already have objections to half the things I say. Did I say anything that the Bible doesn't say? Was I giving you my philosophy or doctrine in any of this so far? And when I say this is my opinion, I say this is my opinion. Amen? The bottom line is Satan opposes the church and longs to be exalted, even if the church were possible. Jesus said in the last day's deception, even some of the elect will be deceived if possible. The deception is going to be so strong and increasing in power that the church is going to be subject to it. Many people are going to fall under it. Don't think you're safe. If you think that you're safe, you're in danger. What you need to have is a sober mind that says, I need to keep watch over my life and over my doctrine, as Paul told Timothy, and I need to take inventory of my life and watch myself, because this stuff creeps in in many different ways. You're never totally safe from it. I, I, I do not recommend taking that arrogant posture, well, God's got me no matter what. Yeah, he does, but you can also get tricked out of it. Amen? Verse 5, the evil is unleashed. Do you not remember that I told you these things while I was still with you? And evidently Paul taught a lot on this, didn't he? He already had, when he was there, he was preaching on this stuff. And you know what is now restraining him so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. 
But the one who now restrains it will continue until he is taken out of the way. Big, that's, a, that's big time right there. Now, sequential time. And then, right? Sequential time. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will slay with the breath of his mouth and annihilate by the majesty of his arrival. Let's take a look at that. Here's the sequential order of that verse. <clears throat> right now we're in the present church age. Right? Everyone agree? We're in the church age right now, or the age of grace. Will this time frame last forever? No, it will not. So right now, the Holy Spirit is restraining the full manifestation of the Antichrist. Right now, where we are, the Holy Spirit is still restraining it, even though he's growing. As long as the church is here, as long as the Holy Spirit is continuing his ministry on earth, the Antichrist cannot fully reign over the earth. But he is progressively gaining power throughout this dispensation. Fact. Let's move on to fact number two. The revelation of the mystery of lawlessness. This is progressive and future tense. When the Holy Spirit withdraws, could this be the rapture? Could this be the rapture of the church? Very high likelihood that what we talked about twice so far about being taken, that when the church is taken, when that event that precedes the return of Christ happens, if the church is taken and the Holy Spirit is withdrawn from the planet, what would happen? Can you imagine if there was no church on the planet right now? Let that sink in, because that's what it's going to be like. No more preaching against sin. No more warning people. No more outreaches. No more Billy Grahams. No more food banks. No more helping the poor. No more missionaries. No more aid. No more prayer. No more love. Imagine what the world would be like without Jesus. The days of Noah, that's exactly it. Exactly. The earth was filled with violence, and the inclination of mankind's heart was continually and only evil. That's what it's going to be like. We see it now. You see it in the United States. You see it in the Western world. We are rebelling against the principles and foundation of truth and God's pattern and design for society. Third fact, the return of Christ is sometime thereafter. The Antichrist is going to have full power for some period of time. He's going to reign, and then he will be overthrown at the return of Christ, and his system will be torn down. So these are sequential events. Paul said, okay, the Holy Spirit is restraining right now. He will be taken out of the way. The devil's going to have full power over the earth, and then the judgment's going to come when Christ returns. Done deal for me. But yet, if I had those different people in the room, I would already have hands going up want to argue with me. Trust me. And here it is. Did I give any of my opinion right here? All I did was disseminate those three verses right there. Did I not? According to exactly what they said. Let's move forward. Deceptive signs and wonders. The coming of the lawless. Now he's going to describe them. The coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by the working of Satan with every kind of power, sign, and false wonder. And with every wicked deception directed against those who are perishing because they refuse to love the love of the truth that would have saved them. So the description of the Antichrist reign, right? This is how lawlessness is implemented. Every kind of power. This is why I warn, especially the charismatic folks, God bless them. But if you seek after constant signs and wonders as the central core of your Christianity, you are open to deception. You say, why do you say that, preacher? 
Because your desire should be for truth, not signs and wonders. That's secondary. Okay? These Christians that are infatuated with spiritual experiences, dangerous. Should we have spiritual experiences? Yes. Are they the central of our Christian faith? No. The Word of God is central to your Christian faith. The truth comes before all things. Did you know the truth comes even before the love of God? You cannot know God's love until you have a heart for truth. Truth is what defines us as Christians. Truth needs to be very important. It needs to be central to what we do. False signs. Yeah, the devil's going to be doing miraculous things. So if you're about signs, there's going to be plenty of them because he knows that's what we want. You don't think he doesn't know that? Imagine if he goes in here and some guy says, you know, you don't have to believe in, Bible, in the Bible. Look what I can do. And makes rainbows appear in the room. Think about that. How many people would go for that? A lot of people would. Imagine if he could make stuff float all of a sudden and say he's from God. People would be like, not this kid. If you speak against the word of God, I said, devil, you get out of here. I'd be the only one standing. They'd probably shoot me too because that's another thing they do when you don't worship them. False wonders. So he's got false powers, false signs, false wonders. Didn't Jesus do all these? He sure enough did. Jesus did a lot of signs and wonders to authenticate himself as the Son of God. But John 6, 6, 6, when it came time to preach the truth... The crowd, 15, 20,000 of them to see the miracle of the loaves and fishes. But when it came down to preach the word, they all left. That's how you know, right? And finally, deception. This is to do with doctrine. This is false teaching. Amen? So you see power, signs, wonders, and false teaching. That is the, the foundation of the Antichrist system. Those that do not have a love for the truth will not be able to discern or resist it, both now and when this fully manifests. Right now, the spirit of Antichrist is moving, is working, and people are not able to resist it. You see it in society all around, right? I saw uh, the big thing in the news, and I'm not, I'm not picking on anyone per se, but this just gives an example of the rebellion against God's design and principles. A he she won the woman's NCAA track race, and there's a big battle over it. It's a man who won the woman's college race. It's just an example of it. That's Antichrist. I do not care if people get mad at me saying that. Because it's the Bible says that. When you rebel against the foundation of God's design and patterns, you are in lawlessness and rebellion. Now, I don't care. You can do whatever you want. I'm not going to pick on it. You have the right to do whatever you want. God gives you that freedom. If they, whatever they want to do, in the, that, hey, that's their right. I won't argue against that. But when you put a man up there in a woman's race and she wins, there's a problem with that. Something very, very wrong. When you're messing with Zion. That's anti All that stuff is antichrist. I see it for exactly what it is. And it's increasing, and now it's okay. Now it's okay. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. If you took a survey right now, probably 80% of people now would say, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, let's get the rainbow out. We love it. If you'd have took that survey 100 years ago, you got hung. People would be like, what in the world? That's how fast we're falling. This is a little example. Amen? The grand illusion. For this reason, because of those things, God's going to send a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie in order that judgment will come upon all who disbelieve the truth and delighted in wickedness. I got bad news. The age of grace is not unlimited. I didn't write this. So if 
Those that do not love God's truth, if you're in that state and you resist continually and reject the gospel of Jesus Christ in your life, and you say, no, I don't want that, and you do it over, there's eventually a time and a place God says, fine. And he gives you over Romans chapter 1. It's interesting how God's judgment manifests. He doesn't burn these people up like Sodom and Gomorrah. He simply gives them over to the desires of those lusts so they're consumed by it in their lives. And they're in a holding pattern of judgment at that point. I didn't say that. That's not my opinion. The powerful delusion is sent as a, as a judgment. So some of these people you see are under judgment. They're consumed by it. So the shocking conclusions. Number one, this is what I took away from this now. You judge this yourself. You have a limited time to come to the knowledge of salvation. Time is not forever, and the invitation is not forever. Number two, God's grace is limited, is powerful and super abundant. We've preached about this. As God's grace is, there's still a limitation to it. It's not a forever invitation. <clears throat> Number three, God's patience is limited. God is not indefinitely patient. As much as he's more patient than I am or will ever be, he still, isn't that good news? No, God has his limits of patience. I don't feel so bad now. <laughs> Number four, eventually, Pharaoh was our example in this. Remember the Old Testament, all those were examples? If you harden your heart, God will give you over to a reprobate mind so that you accept deception as truth and thus cannot come to the revelation of salvation. I didn't write that. That's just taken from the last sentence there. Number five, a reprobate mind is therefore put in a holding pattern of disbelief and deception so that they are reserved for judgment. Now, this is very important for all of us here. It is God's sovereign right alone to judge and determine the state of any person. As believers, we need to continue to minister the reconciliation. We need to walk graciously and present the gospel of Christ lovingly. We are not in a place to judge anybody out there that's God's position. This is where the balance has to come in. Or else you're going to be like Westboro Baptist Church out there preaching condemnation. So we have to be very careful as believers that, look, these people are going crazy, but for me, I'm going to keep preaching to them. I'm going to keep loving on them. God's going to sort all that out. Amen? And that's the, the practical, holistic uh, stand we need to take on what I'm saying here so you don't walk away that I'm judging and being harsh. Amen? And it ends with this, but we should always thank God for you and the brothers who are loved by the Lord, especially Pastor Eric, because God has chosen you from the beginning to be saved by the sanctification of the Spirit and faith in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brothers... Two things you need to do here. All this teaching that we just went through is for two reasons. To help the church stand firm in the midst of persecution and wickedness. There are times when you are not to be on the offensive, but you need to be on the defensive. And this is a defensive teaching. There are times when the persecution and the hard things are coming and you simply need to stand firm. This is a very important part of the teaching. You have to stand firm. You have to stand firm. You know, JR's uh, and Deb are a good example right now. You've got to stand firm. This is, this is crazy hard stuff you're going through. You've got to stand firm. Don't lose anything you gained right now. You hold your ground. Amen? You've got to stand firm. 
There are times in your life when you've got to stand firm. You've got to defend yourself. Amen? And secondly, he says, and cling to the traditions we taught you, whether by speech or by letter. And uh, there are certain segments of Christianity that love to twist this verse. See? We need traditions. The, the context of this and the meaning of this is not man-made traditions that add to your godliness. That nullifies the Word of God. The traditions here are the teachings and the way of life of the apostles. The teachings and the way of life for the apostles and the spiritual leaders. So, in other words, Paul is saying here, the way that I showed you by example, and all the things we discussed, and I sat, and I lived in front of you, and I taught you while I was with you, you need to cling to those things. That's what he's saying here. Not some man-made tradition like putting up candles in the church services. That has nothing to do with anything. It's about the teaching and the way of life that the Apostle Paul and, and Barnabas and all of them lived in front of them. Amen? That's it, right? How do you like that? That's all I got to say for today.